Now we got to try that again. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, that was great. I love it. Well, first of all, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to our 31st annual Client Appreciation Economic Outlook, the Economy and Your World event. So again, warm welcome on behalf of Tim Kimmel, Adam Jordan, myself, and all the members of the Paul Reed Financial Team, and it's your team to serve. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Lewis Ratty, who's going to shed some light on just the very question I spoke about, but also some principles to keep in mind as you think through the portfolios that you have. So Lewis Ratty is a senior investment director for Hartford Funds. Um, he regularly speaks to institutions and financial advisors and investors providing insights on the economy throughout the United States. He'll address the current state of the economy, some of the opportunities, some of the principles that are important to keep in mind. Lewis joined Hartford in, in 2017. Prior to joining the company, he worked for PNC Asset Management as a manager and research analyst. He was responsible for due diligence of recommended investment managers on the firm's research platforms. Prior to working for PNC, he had similar roles at the Bank of New York, BNY Mellon, SE, and SEI Investments. He originally hails from Leviton, Pennsylvania, attended Bloom, Bloomsburg University, received a bachelor's degree in business economics, and then Pennsylvania State University, where he received an MBA in business with a finance concentration. A well-respected speaker and well-received throughout the United States, Lewis Ratty. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you. Um, so as Paul said, I'm Louis Ratty. I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, first, I just want to thank Paul Reed Financial Group for having me out today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I want to thank all of you for coming out, uh, spending your precious, precious time with us. Uh, time is the one commodity that we can't buy more of. So thank you. Um, I am from Philadelphia area, so I, I got in time last night to watch Game 7 of the NLCS. I went to Game 6, I thought for sure the Phillies were going to win, I was all excited. Uh, went home sad, and then I went to bed sad again last night. But um, as I was complaining to members of the Paul Reed team, uh, they said, well, have you looked at the Mariners lately? I think they went to the playoffs last year, but it, I read 22 of the last 23 years are negative. So uh, I guess I can't complain too much. Um, so I've been in the investment industry since the late 90s, so about 25 years now. Um, started in 99, so a challenging period if you remember, you know, 98, 99, then the tech, uh, the tech wreck or the, the tech bubble, however you want to say it. Um, but I feel like I've been in the investment industry my entire life. So my father's a financial advisor and he's in the late 70s right now. Um, and I bought my first stock when I was 10 years old. Um, let me talk a little bit more about my role. I work at Hartford Funds. Hartford Funds, as Paul said, is a $140 billion asset manager. Uh, we've got feet on the street, boots on the ground across all the geographies you could think of, um, international, emerging markets, frontier markets. Um, we work with two money managers exclusively. One is Wellington Management Company based out of Boston. They manage a trillion dollars in assets for clients. And we also work with Schroeder's Investment Manager that's based in London who manages 600 billion for clients. So uh, we've got pretty deep tentacles in the industry. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm bringing those insights to you today, those from around the world. Like Paul, I like to start with maybe some, some polling questions also, you know, get those synopsis firing, get the gray, ma gray matter moving around a little bit. Um, so with a show of hands, how many of you would say we're already in a recession right now? Anybody you feel like we're in a recession? Not really, not too many, right? Okay. All right, that's fair. Um, and, and reminder, recession is two quarters of negative growth in GDP, gross domestic product. Okay. Uh, how many feel like, though, we'll go into a recession within the next 12 months? So between now and, let's say, next Christmas. All right, we're getting a few more hands now. Okay. Um, well, our research and probabilities say mm, that, that, that may be the case. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But um, we think there's a high probability there's a slowdown. But whether we go into an actual recession, I think that's still touch and go, if I can use a, a Boeing analogy. Um, final question uh, is, what's your biggest concern over the next six months? Okay, I'm going to read four answers, and then we'll go through them and, and do the raise of hands thing. Uh, so number one would just be the global unrest. Right? So that's whether the war in Ukraine, uh, the war in the Middle East, uh, the, the general unrest you know, that we all feel globally. Um, 
Answer B, upcoming recession. Answer C, a potential housing crisis. I know homes have gotten expensive here like the rest of the world, so is there another crash on the horizon, a la 07, 08? And then D, choice D, stocks being overvalued. So those are probably the four biggest risks I hear from clients when I speak to them every day. So let's go through them again. All right, show of hands. Okay, global unrest. Is that one of your biggest fears? Okay, I'm not even going to do the rest then. <laughs> so I feel the same way. Honestly, I think that's the biggest wild card, not just politics, but um, you know, dictatorial governments are very unpredictable. You know, I think back to um, it was February of last year, and you know, the the war in Ukraine. I mean, our portfolio managers, our strategists at both Wellington Insurers were aware of Russian troops lining up on the border, um, but they assigned a very low probability to Putin actually invading. I mean, it was 15 percent or less, right? And so that's what we do. We do risk reward calculations, right? And so some portfolio managers may have owned Russian securities, Russian bonds, because they're getting really attractive yields on them. There was potential for strong returns. Um, and so you have to weigh those probabilities. You know, what, are the, what are the chances that he's actually going to invade? I mean, this looked terrible in the world. He's never going to do it. And it happened. And so um, I, I think those are always the biggest tail risks or, or the biggest things that kind of keep us up at night, us investment strategists. So not too different than, than all of you. Um, let me find my clicker here. Let's start going through some slides here. Um, okay, this is the broad presentation. Okay, these are some of the key concepts we're going to talk about today. And I want to actually read these um, because I think they're a little bit difficult to read from where you're sitting. Am I right? Yeah, okay. All right. So my, my eyes aren't so good either. Um, these come out, my friend's an eye doctor, and I wear like a negative seven, and my wife is like a negative six in contact lenses, and I told my friend that before we had kids. He's like, oh, your kid's gonna be walking into walls. <laughs> that one always makes me laugh. Okay, so, so here's some key lessons throughout history, and I apologize, I'm on this side of the room. I'll spend some time on that side later, I apologize. Um, so your behavior matters more than the market's behavior. We're gonna talk about this a lot today. Um, I've got a number of slides at the end that have hypothetical illustrations, but your behavior that matters. Oh, am I out of the range? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Look at that, wow. Technical difficulties. <laughs> um, so number two, patience is an undervalued investment virtue. And then the third one is historical perspective can help you stay calm when others are panicking. As I said, I have bad eyes. Um, but I think those are three really important conce concepts and are, are really going to make up probably the crux of this presentation as I go through the slides. Um, we need to be focused on the long term. All of us need to be focused on the long term and not get caught up in short term events. Um, I'll probably get a question later. Please stop me at any time, too. I should have said this already, but as you can see, I'm pretty informal. If I say something that, you know, sparks a question, just shoot your hand up. I'll come over. Yeah, we can bring the microphone around or I can come over, we can repeat the question. At any time, please stop me. It doesn't have to be so formal that you wait till the end or anything along those lines. Um, but going back to the slide, patience, right? So let's stay focused on our long-term goals. I think that's why Paul Reed and the team are here. Um, I don't want to create too many calls here, team, but you know, when, when you're feeling those moments where um, it feels like you, know, you want to panic or th there's just, no sunlight ahead, that's the time to call the team here. They'll help you stay focused on the long-term goals. Um, let's go to our next slide here. All right, so this is just an overview of what we're gonna talk about. Um, you can see the three broad topics, but let's jump ahead. Bam, unemployment. So Paul covered some of these topics already, but I'm, I'm gonna cover them again in, in, in just maybe a little bit more depth. Before I get into the economic slides, I wanna talk a little bit about the stock market and some of the gains this year. So, so Paul talked at a high level. The S&P 500 is an index of the top five largest companies in the United States. The S&P is up about 10 to 12 percent this year, so pretty good. Um, the NASDAQ, which is more of a, a tech composite index, um, is up almost 30 percent. It's about 25. There's been some, some losses over the past two months. Um, but, but the point I wanted to make is that you know, when you talk to strategists at the end of last year, even the beginning of this year, this was a surprise to us. I mean, we weren't expecting these sort of returns. We know last year was painful, but, but again, even we weren't expecting these sort of returns. We thought the economy would slow quicker than it has, um, but the economy has been much more resilient than even we expected. I think there's a couple reasons for that, and we'll talk about that later. 
Um, but that strength of the stock market on the surface um, is, it maybe, it maybe uh, undermines some of the weakness, though, in the broader economy and in the rest of the stock market. So as Paul said, the gains have really been driven by the top seven stocks, right? So the Magnificent Seven, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, NVIDIA. So that's really masking some of the, the, some of the you know, weaker performance under the surface. So the, the, the top seven have made up about 70% of returns year to date, and the bottom 493 are essentially flat. So that's not really indicative of a healthy stock market, right? That tells you that there's a couple companies that are doing well, and everything else is doing not so well, right? So that, that to me is a bit of a, a, bit of a red flag. Um, and one thing that we're looking at, it's called stock market internals. And so we say the internals right now are not that healthy. Two things can happen from here, though. So those companies at the top can continue to perform well, and the other 493 will catch up. That would be a positive. The, uh, the, the other thing that could happen is those top seven run out of steam, right? And then they kind of float back to earth, and, and now you end up with returns that are essentially flat like the rest of the market. So that's kind of two directions right now we think the market could go. So just be aware of that, number one. Um, the other thing, when you get this sort of concentration, so everyone, everyone's buying those top seven stocks. So that means they're much more expensive right now. And the way to think about valuations, and this is you know, a, bit, a bit of a... Uh, a scary analogy, but one that I think is impactful for clients is when you buy a stock, let's say, and it's trading at 40 or 50 times earnings, right? That's a historically high level. That's like being on the 20th, 30th, 40th floor of a building and the elevator shaft snaps, right? There's a long way to go down, right? There's a lot of what we call air in the multiple. There's room for the price to go down a lot. However, if you were to buy a stock that trades a little bit more reasonably, let's say at 12, 13, 14 times earnings, that's a much more reasonable number. And again, if you know, you're an elevator and the, the shaft snaps and you're on the fifth floor, there's less room to go down. And so maybe, maybe you're, you're less injured in that scenario. So that's the same way to think about the stock market. And when you hear about, and you turn on CNBC and you hear about excessive valuations of the market being expensive, that's essentially what they mean. If a company doesn't hit their quarterly earnings, there's a lot of room for the price to go down. Whereas if you buy something inexpensive and you know, it misses its earnings, there's a less room for it to go down. So that's the stock market broadly. Let's talk about some of these economic stats, right? So this is as of 6.30. So as of 9.30, these have already changed a little bit. Um, but the unemployment rate is 3.8% currently. Still a pretty big decline from April of 2020 when we were at 14, 15%. Right? So huge improvement. Obviously, we know that was a bit of an anomaly you know, due to what was going on at the time of COVID. Um, one of the goals of, of the Fed when they're raising interest rates is to slow the economy. But another one of their goals is also to slow down the employment picture a little bit, aka they want the unemployment rate to rise a little bit. The reason they want to do that is because for the last 18 months to two years, consumers or workers, we've really had the power, meaning there's been very strong wage gains. Companies have had to pay us more right, to keep up with inflation. Um, but unfortunately, it, there's something called a wage price spiral. As you pay people more, the prices of goods go up, and it's sort of a never-ending cycle. And so the Fed wants to raise unemployment. They want to get it to 5 6 7%. In our view, we don't think it's going to go past 5%, which is great you know, for, for Main Street, which is what I care about. You know? um, I still take paychecks. Like I said, my wife's a school teacher, so Main Street's important to me. Um, but we think it'll get to about 5% unemployment, the reason being two reasons. Unemployment's remained really resilient for two broad reasons. One, there's fewer workers in the marketplace. So COVID forced a lot of early retirements. I've got a, an anecdote from my personal life. Uh, my mom's in her mid-70s. Um, she's, well, she did work at uh, ShopRite. She was a cashier at ShopRite for 10 plus years. COVID happened, I remember calling her, mom, you have to stop working immediately. You're gonna catch this thing. You work at a supermarket, hand to hand. So she quit. And so now my mom's retired. She probably would have worked for another five, six, seven years, but she left the workforce early. She and her husband, now they live in New Jersey. They now take motorcycle trips all across the United States. So this year they went to Sturgis, from New Jersey to Sturgis on their motorcycle. Crazy. I wouldn't do that now, but she loves it. Um, so that's one thing. So there's less people in the workforce right now. The other is something we're calling labor hoarding. Essentially, um, companies are holding on to their labor. So even if earnings are down for a company, they're not, go they're not going to be so quick 
to fire or let go of people because of how hard it was to find labor during the pandemic. I mean, I think all of you remember in 2021, even parts of 2022, everywhere you went, it was like, oh, well, uh, restaurants, for example. You go to a restaurant and the hostess tells you it's gonna be a 20 minute wait and you look and half the restaurant's empty. You're like, I don't understand. Well, oh, we don't have the workers to you know, fill the tables and, and service them. So um, labor hoarding is another reason that we believe unemployment's not gonna spike too, too much, which again, I think is broadly good for the economy and good for us, us workers. Um, let's talk about inflation. Let me pause, actually. Any questions so far? All right, I know that was a random pause, but I just figured why not. Um, all right, so let's talk about inflation, CPI. Paul mentioned this earlier. Uh, inflation got up to about 9%. We are down now in the mid threes. It got as low as 3%, now it's back up to about 3.8. Nevertheless, that's still much, much better. We do think it might be a little bit more challenging to get back down to that 2% number. That may take a few more quarters. Um, but nevertheless, we, we think it's a positive that we've gotten back uh, as quickly as, as we uh, have. Uh, let, me, let me see the next stat here. It's, it's hard for me to see here. The next stat is the 10-year Treasury yield. So this is one that's changed a lot. Right, if you look right here, I think it says 3.9%, if I remember correctly. This is close to 5% now. So why is this important? Well, the 10-year Treasury yield is essentially a benchmark for things like mortgage rates, uh, car loans. And that's why, as Paul said, mortgage rates are at 8%. Auto loans are, for used cars are close to 10% right now. Right? And so that has been a big shock to the system. Um, a reminder sort of here on kind of a, a bond math and how it works is as interest rates go up, the value of your bond portfolio goes down. So that's why last year, many of you maybe have seen your statements or, or know that, hey, wait a minute, why is the fixed income or the bond portion of my portfolio negative? It's because interest rates went up. Again, when interest rates go up, the value of your bond portfolio goes down. The good thing is for all of you is that the way your portfolios are positioned with, you, with, with Paul Reed and his team is that they're on the shorter duration. So meaning as rates go up, you're less affected by those moves. So that, that is, a, is a, a huge positive. Um, if, I, if I could have all, all the financial advisors and teams that I work with manage portfolios in the way the teams here do, it, it, if I could wave a wand and make that happen, that would be incredible. Um, so that, that's been a big change, rates. Uh, the final thing I, I think is on here is what? CD rates? Is that, is that the final thing, if I can see it? What do we have? We've got CDs and oil. Okay, let's talk CDs. So I think CDs say about 2.5%, 3% on here. Uh, CDs now are closer to 5%. And we're going to talk about this in a moment because um, if you're anything like uh, my parents or most clients that I speak to, they say, oh, well, if CDs are at 5%. Well, then why shouldn't I just put everything I own in CDs right now? You guarantee me 5%. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but that, that has changed a little bit. Those CD rates, rates will not be here forever. So that's the first thing to remember. And then oil, oil's up as well, um, not surprisingly, you know, due to the war. All right, that's, that one's probably pretty, pretty obvious to all of you. All right, so let's go to the next slide here. All right, so this slide shows the earnings of S&P 500 companies. All right, so these are all the companies, the S&P 500, take all of the earnings, divide by 500. Um, but before I get to that, I think I just want to touch on GDP one more time. Uh, so as a reminder, GDP is gross domestic products, the value of all the goods and services produced by an economy, okay? That's essentially how we measure the health of the economy. 2%, just like inflation, 2% is, is generally the number where you would say an economy is healthy, but the economy is not overheating, right? So over the past 10 years previous to this, this year, so I would say from 2010 to 2020, let's do, let's do pre-COVID. It's, it's a better barometer because as all of you know, COVID has thrown everything off. Pre-COVID, we averaged 2.5% GDP. Q1 of this year, we were at 1.8%. Q2 was 2.4. Now for Q3, we're, we're expecting almost 5%. It's going to be 4.5%, 5%. So quite an acceleration. And that's one thing that surprised us and, and you know, basically every other money manager around the world. We, we didn't realize how resilient uh, all of your balance sheets were. There's a couple things going on. One, there was all those transfer payments from the government, so we're all flushed with cash. That's been helpful. Another big one is homeowner equity. Right, and so I've gotten a lot of questions, and maybe folks will have questions about the housing market later, but you know, one positive with the housing market, if we split you know, commercial and residential separately from a residential standpoint, so 95% of Americans have fixed rate mortgages. That's not always the case in Europe. Fixed rates are not as plentiful 
in Europe. So that's a positive. Number two, 70% of Americans are locked in at 4% or below. So I look around this room, are, you, are most of you locked in at 4% or below? Head nods, yeah. Yeah, so I, that is another huge positive. Um, and then the final piece is inventory. Uh, if you remember 07, 08, part of the reason that we had that great financial crisis or the global financial crisis, however you want to say the GFC, was housing related. Builders overbuilt. Everyone thought they were a flipper, if you remember. Everyone knew somebody that was flipping houses and making all this money. Um, and so for the 10 years post GFC, there's been underdevelopment. And so now we're in a situation where there's a scarcity of inventory. And that's why, I don't know about this area, I know it's certainly happened in my area, there's been a lot of bidding wars, right? You know, the classic, you know, first home, three to four bedrooms, you know, one and a half to two and a half bathrooms, they're in short supply. And so you'll see those bids go 20, 30% over asking price, no inspection, cash only, et cetera. So that, that's, I would say, broadly speaking, the health of the consumer and specifically the, the health of the housing market is one of the things that I think all of us, you know, investment strategists sort of underestimated. Um, and so going to get a really good GDP figure for Q3. In the next 12 months, though, we do expect that to weaken. Um, the Fed's, again, as I said earlier, the Fed's entire goal here of raising interest rates is to make borrowing more expensive, right? Whether that's borrowing for a mortgage, buying for auto loans, et cetera. So if it's more expensive, there's probably gonna be less of it, right? So that's the Fed's goal, to slow down the economy. And if you watch the financial press, you've probably heard these scenarios, right? Have you heard, uh, again, we've got a big Boeing audience, so you probably know these scenarios as well. Soft landing, hard landing, no landing. Have you heard these scenarios? Anybody? Yeah, okay. To me, I think they're a little bit funny. I'm like, have you ever been on a plane that didn't land? Like, no. They all run out of gas eventually, and it's no different with the economy. And, and so the next 12 months is sort of the, the, the time frame when we expect, particularly middle to end of next year, is where we really expect to see that slowdown kick in. Do we get into a recession? <sighs> Again, touch and go. I, it, it's, it, and I hate to be glib and not give an answer, but that is our true feeling. I, I think the best takeaway and the best way that I frame it to clients is that even if we do go into a recession, our expectations are for a very shallow recession, right? So it's not gonna be 2000, 2007, 2008, because we don't have the same excesses. Yeah, I mentioned you know, Tesla and Nvidia being expensive, right? But it's not like those other excesses. So back to 99 and 2000 when I was starting, so many companies had, had no earnings, right? They were, they were pre-revenue. Right, so no revenue, no earnings, and they were still trading at 40, 50, 60, 70 times earnings. And they had no earnings. Right? But it was projected earnings. If you could look far enough out into the future, because the internet was going to change the world, um, that could justify the price you pay. And it's true. The internet did change the world, but just not as quickly as those prices suggested. Um, so that, that's a big reason for that. Um, so uh, where's I going? Oh, back to GDP. So, our view, middle of next year to the end of next year is where you probably see that slow down. Um, the analogy to think about, going back to that point, it, it's not gonna be as severe. Instead of like falling off a cliff, right? Like the economy just fell off a cliff when COVID happened. Think of it as like stepping into like a marsh or a bog, right? You don't really fall that far in, but now you're kind of up to your shins in like this mess and it's very hard to get out of, right? And that's, there could be some sort of economic malaise maybe afterwards and where we're kicking around in that zero to 2% GDP environment. That's kind of the way um, our expectations are leaning. Um, all right, so let's go back to the slide. So this is showing earnings of S&P 500 companies. As you can see, S&P earnings have been very strong. Generally speaking, it's, it's a loose, loose rule that the economy and earnings are sort of related. I, I would say earnings are really what drive the stock market, but then the question I always get is, well, what's the relationship between the stock market and the economy? And so what I like to use, what, what, what's a big park around here? Is there a famous park in the Seattle area, anyone? What's a big park people walk their dogs in? What am I hearing? Green Lake? Is that right? Okay, all right. So I want you to think about Green Lake Park and there's a man or a woman and they're walking their dog, okay? And the dog's a very excitable breed too, like uh, let's say Jack Russell, okay? So what's the Jack Russell doing as he's on a walk with the owner? I mean, he's chasing birds, he's chasing squirrels, he's sniffing every fire hydrant, you know, he's, he's going nuts. And what's the person doing? Slowly walking through Green Park or Green Lane Park, right? 
And so that's sort of the relationship between the stock market and the economy. The economy is the dog walker. Right? You're slowly moving in a line. Hopefully it's an upward trajectory. And when the stock market is just zigging and zagging and bouncing all around based on every presidential tweet, uh, every news report from CNN, you know, that's, that's kind of the relationship. And so when you think about and you hear folks like me talking about the economy and why it's important, know that, yeah, the, the, the economy is the, the sort of the general health, right? That's GDP. And, and the stock market is going to loosely follow that. So if the, if the economy is on an upward trajectory, you should expect your stock portfolio to follow. All right, let's go to the next slide in the interest of time. I'm telling too many stories here. All right, so now this is a slide that up until this year I haven't been talking about very much. Um, reason being is CDs and checking accounts weren't paying very much, so there wasn't much to talk about. But now we're in a new environment where yields and interest rates are a little bit higher. Um, and so on the far left, let me see how far I can go. Um, Mr. Microphone. Oh, let me grab my clicker, actually, so I can point. So on the far left here, here, you have your cash rates. Right, so that's what you're getting on your cash, CDs, short-term investments right now. You can see again, right here is cash. Right. Next is one to three year treasury. This is five to seven, and this is 10 year. And so what we're trying to show you is that the further out, 12 months after the Fed stops hiking, the further out your bond portfolio is, you know, the more money you've made historically. So let's just, we'll just step back here. This, this slide essentially helps answer the question why you shouldn't be in CDs and cash forever. All right, so CDs and cash are great for a short-term investment. I mean, short-term tactical trade, are talking zero to three months. Right, but they're not a long-term investment decision, right? Right off the top, even if you're getting three and a half right now, like right now um, at TD Bank, I get three and a half percent. My Fidelity account's like 3.8. Well, I just mentioned inflation's 3.8 right now, right? So you're not even keeping up with inflation. So I'm a big car guy. Um, if I had bought a 69 Mustang and, you know, 1969, it was about $3,000. If I had just put that 3,000 bucks under my mattress, say, you know, I'm going to wait a couple years and then I'll buy a Mustang or I'll wait, you know, 25 years and I'll buy a Mustang. That 3,000 wasn't getting me a set of wheels on that Mustang, right? So that's just the nature of inflation. So that's why right off the top, inflation is going to erode your cash and CDs right off the top. Number two, those rates are not going to be here for long. The reason cash and CD rates are so high right now is because the Fed has been raising interest rates. But it's our view that we're in the ninth inning there, to use a, a baseball analogy, talking about the Mariners and Phillies earlier. We're in the ninth inning. There may be one more Fed rate hike, and then that's it. The Fed has gotten the economy to a point, and it's, they've gotten their monetary policy to a point that it's restrictive enough. They don't need to continue to raise rates. And so what you're likely to see now is, you know, let's say you locked in at a 5% six-month CD in six months. Now you're going to have all the cash from that, and you're going to have something called a reinvestment risk, because guess what? Your CDs are not going to be there at 5% anymore. Maybe it's down to 3.5%. So this slide is just encouraging folks to, instead of just having all of their money in short-term uh, bonds, put them in intermediate or longer-term bonds. And I'll, I'll give you a quick, this is a little bit in the weeds, but for, I heard there was an engineer from Boeing here, so there's maybe some other folks that are, you know, really enjoy the numbers and the math. When it comes to fixed income and bonds, we use a term called duration, right? And duration is a measure of your interest rate sensitivity. So if you see these things, it says there's a, a cash, then there's one to three years. That's one to three years of duration. Five to seven, that's your years of duration. Then there's 10-year treasuries. So 10-year treasuries have 10 years of duration. So again, duration is a measure of interest rate sensitivity. So I talked earlier about when interest rates go up, you lose money. And if interest rates go down, you gain money. So here's, here's the bond math here. On a 10-year treasury, so you have 10 years of duration, if interest rates go up 1%, you automatically lose 10% on the value of your bond portfolio. Conversely, if interest rates were to go down, you'd automatically make 10% on the value of your bond portfolio, in addition to the 4% yield you're getting. So what, why this chart is interesting is showing you that after the Fed's last rate hike, you generally make more money in longer-term bonds. 
So let me go back to my point again here. So after the Fed's last rate hike, you make more money. Why is that? Well, what is the Fed trying to do by hiking rates? What have I been talking about? When you hike rates, what do you do to the economy? Slow it down, right? So if you slow down the economy, interest rates go down. So that's essentially what this chart is showing you, that, hey, after the Fed stopped hiking, after they've tightened monetary policy and, made, made, and, and essentially choked the economy, right, being in longer-term bonds makes sense going forward because you have way more risk-return potential. So that, that's essentially what this chart is showing. Why don't own CDs? Why start to go into longer-duration bonds? As I mentioned earlier, your team at Paul Reed is, is shorter duration now. That's been an incredible call because rates have spiked all the way up to 5%. Right? But in our view, the chances of going to 550 or 6 are a, a low probability event. So I'm sure Paul and the team, when they get comfortable and they'll start to slowly move you into those longer duration bonds, and so when the recession hits, or when the stock market goes down, you're in those bonds, and what's going to happen? Rates go down, the value of your bond portfolios are going to go up. So I know that was a little bit in the weeds, but I get excited about that stuff. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a little bit of, a bit of a nerd. I'm sorry. Um, so we'll, we'll, in the interest of time, I'll blow through the next couple of slides. Time is flying. Um, this chart talks about fixed income, bonds, which we just talked about. Um, and this year, right now, the, the U.S. aggregate bond index, which is a broad measure of bonds, is down about 3.5% year to date. It's going to be the first time ever in history that the bonds have had three years of negative returns. It's never happened. And you can look at this chart here. This goes back very, very, very far, as you can see. Um, but the point of the chart is to remind folks that historically, after a bad one year, two years, bonds have come back very, very strong. And so those are our expectations uh, again this time around. All right, I'm going to breeze over this one. Essentially, what we're showing is on the far left-hand left -hand side of the slide, those are your safer investments. So you're going to get lower returns, less risk. On the far right side, Stronger returns, more risk. I think we all understand that concept, right? But the point really, though, is diversification, right? Can't put all your eggs in one basket. This year's a great example of that. Last year, the market's down 25%. If you would call Paul Reed or one of the client advisors and said, hey, you know, I'm really scared, go to cash, you'd have missed out on 30% in the NASDAQ, and you would have missed out another 15% in the S&P 500. So again, it's just about diversification and not trying to time the market. Um, okay, so internationals is a topic that comes up a lot with clients. Uh, internationals underperformed the U.S. for the past 10 plus years. I have another chart in here, I think it's 12 and a half. Uh, so we'll get that question. So why do I even own international? And, and bl believe me, I have a home country bias as well. I think all of us are, are sort of uh, in the same boat from that respect. But this chart really shows the benefits of diversification. So what we're showing is that over the past 10 calendar years, the top, the 50 best performing stocks in the world, right, globally. So there's a universe of 20,000 stocks, right? See the average on the far right says 82% of those companies have been international or domiciled overseas. So this chart is essentially saying that the U.S. isn't always the best, as the slide shows, that the top performing companies, the majority of the time, have actually been based overseas. And this is really where active management comes into play. Um, so Paul, and Paul Reed Financial Group and the rest of the team obviously go through, they, they, they screen, they vet, they find the right managers who could take advantage of these sorts of dynamics. It's their job to sift through that universe of 20,000 global securities and find the stocks that are going to perform the best. Um, all right, I really like this next slide. All right, so let's jump to this one. So I may have to move around a little bit again to explain it and my mic might go out, but I'll talk louder. But what's the first thing you do when you get in a car? After you put the keys in the ignition, let's say, what do you do? Seatbelt, seat exactly. Love it. Thank you. So this slide to me is buckle your seatbelt. When you're invested in the stock market, buckle your seatbelt. Right? Because even on the years where returns have been really strong, intra-year, you've had some pretty big drawdowns, right? So these blue bars. This is the past 10 calendar years. This is the return at the end of the year. So you can see the majority of the time it's been pretty positive, right? And this average is about 9%. But look at these years, right? So uh, this is what, 29% here in 2021? 
Well, we had a drawdown of either that's five or eight, I can't say, but either way. But you see my point here, look at 2020. The market ended the year up 18%, but all of us remember March and April and the market was down 33%. All right, so the point of this slide is just to say intra-year volatility is very, very, very common. Look at these years, and look at this. Down 27 in 2009, that was the beginning of the year, right? And then in March, April of 2009 is when the Fed stepped in and said, you know what, we're gonna rescue the banks, and the, and the stock market took off. But again, if you had gone to cash, you'd have missed all that return. So again, I love this, I love this slide. That's the uh, buckle your seatbelt slide. Um, all right, let's move ahead. So I talked earlier about US versus international. This is another depiction of that dynamic. So when the, the blue is above the line, that's when the US is outperforming. And when the blue is below the line, that's when international is outperforming. So there was a period from 2000 to 2010, they call it the lost decade, because essentially with the S&P 500 was flat, it was again, just when I joined the industry, we're coming off the tech bubble. You know, it took Amazon 15 years from the height of the tech bubble to get back to where it was um, pre-tech bubble. Um, but so they call that the lost decade, right? But again, that's why you're not investing in just US stocks, because look, international is outperforming that entire time. Right? And now we're in a period of US outperformance. Right? It's been 12 and a half years. Um, these cycles are pretty long cycles. But again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's gonna flip. I've been actually talking to clients for the past two years saying that, hey, I'm getting more constructive on international. Um, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. You know, We have been more constructive on it probably, I would say, over the past year. But the US is still outperforming. But there's always reasons to invest overseas. And, and, and one of the best that I can think of is, you know, I joined again in 99 and 2000. A portfolio manager said to me once, Lou, you make more money when things go from bad to good than from good to great. All right, and international is kind of an example of that right now, talking about, like, think about China, right? There's not really great news coming out of China from a corporate standpoint. The stock market's in a bear market. Um, they stopped publishing unemployment figures for folks under 35 once it got north of 20%, right? So it's not a great picture, right, from, from what we can see. Then you go to different countries in Europe, um, you've got inflation that's been pretty hard to suppress there. Um, you, you've got just, just political dynamics that are a little bit different overseas, right? Think of just you know, Brexit and uh, the EU. But again, how much is that is maybe already priced in? It's underperformed for 12 plus years, right? Compared to the US where you know, the US is the best. Well, you also have to pay for that then. So I would say international is definitely a place where we're starting to get a little bit more constructive. We think a lot of it's been priced in. The valuations, as I was talking about earlier, are much more attractive. Um, and the other thing is you're getting paid to wait. So internationally, you get a, a nice dividend yield, like four to five percent, relative to the U.S. dividend yield is only about one and a half percent. So international is just again, this is just a reminder of why you own international, because again, this is a client just this is a client question that comes up a lot, uh, especially in light of the past ten years' performance. All right, let me move ahead here. Growth first value. This is just another way to think about how much the market moves in cycles. Another reason we're talking about diversification. Paul mentioned it right before I got on stage, diversification is one of the themes of today. But a growth investment is essentially you know, a company that can grow their earnings 20, 30, 40, 50% year over year, so you have to pay more for those companies. A value company would be a company that maybe can't grow its earnings as quickly, so therefore it wants to return capital to shareholders in a way like dividends. Di uh, value stocks are gonna trade much more expensive. You know, PEs of, let's say, price to earnings ratio of maybe eight to 12. Growth stocks can be from, you know, 20 to 50. But you can see, look at that blue bar, growth stocks have been winning for the past few years. But again, this is another dynamic where we don't want to get too far off sides either way. So last year, value dramatically outperformed growth by over 10%. And so if last year you had called the team and said, oh, let's go all into value right now because it's starting to do really well. And eh, well, this year, value's up about 5% and growth's up 25 to 30%, right? So again, this is another slide diversification. So hopefully that's one of the things that you leave with today is just diversification and then also patience and not being short, too short-term or in. Speaking about short-term orientation, so this is a list of the top 10 stock market drops and then the subsequent recoveries. And so as I, as I look at this chart, the first thing that jumps out uh, in my mind is 87. So I was 
nine years old. Um, and I can remember my dad coming home that day. He was, he was a little upset that day. Let me just, just put it that way. He was definitely down in the dumps. Um, but let me get closer so I can read some of these numbers, right? So forgive me, I know that's a sensitive microphone. So you can see, look at that. So we're down 20% in one day, and it took 264 days to recover that, right? So it definitely took some time. Look at number two and three. Number two and three are during COVID. Those are two of the other biggest drops we've ever had. But look at the time to recover. Again, 19 days, 20 days. You know, these things come back quick, right? So the, again, point we're showing here is patience. You know, when you're feeling like, you know, it just, just looks gloomy, all the news on TV is terrible, Kramer's yelling, sell, 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 he's hitting the button. This is the time when you call the team and just talk through it and you try and put some long-term perspective around it. Um, the U.S. equity markets and the U.S. stock market has been extreme, extremely resilient to external shocks and I have full faith that will continue in the future. Um, next slide, the folly of market timing. So I need to listen to this one a little bit. I, I, I am sometimes uh, my own biggest enemy on this one. I know I should know better, but I'm like, oh, I'm in the industry. I can time it. I know when to go into cash, know when to go out of cash, but uh, my returns have paid for it, let me tell you. What we're essentially showing you here, though, is if you had, over the past 30 years, taken $10,000 and basically left it alone, right? You're fully invested. That's the bar on the far left. The numbers are too far away for me to read, but I think we all get the picture. Um, this next bar here that is steeply, steeply lower, that's if you miss just the 10 best days. Just the 10 best days over the past, this is I think a 35 year sample. Again, you're missing the 20 worst days and if you miss the 30 best days. And unfortunately, you know when some of the best days happen? In a bear market. Because that's when you get these really violent rips in the market. Everybody's selling, 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 and then you get these days where the market rips violently upwards. Right, and so it's e even more important, these 10 best days, again, generally happen in bear markets to just stay invested, not sell, don't panic. I got one of those calls from my mom about two weeks ago, so I had to show her that exact slide. You know, in the war, when, when uh, unfortunately the invasion happened in, in, in Gaza and Israel, and I got, I got that phone call. Um, so oh, let, me, let, me, let me go ahead. The next slide is a number of bull markets. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna read them all, but this is a client-friendly presentation, so anybody, uh, we can send this to you afterwards. You can look through the slides, it's interesting. Um, the two most important stats on here, though, that I wanna read, because they relate to the next chart as well. So the two bullets I'm gonna highlight are, one, the average gain in a bull market is 115%. That's the average gain in a bull market, over 100%. Average length of a bull market, it's over two and a half years, so 2.7 years. Okay, now we go to the next slide. These are your, your bear market slides, right? And, you, and a bear market, as a reminder, is any time the market goes down 20% or more, that's what a bear market is. 10% we call correction, 20% is a true bear market. And they're not uncommon. We've, this is a 100 year sample, we've had 27 of them, okay? But they are healthy parts of the cycle, bear markets. And I, I think of a bear market almost as um, you know when you're using your iPhone too much or your cell phone too much or you leave it in the car and it says iPhone temperature too high shuts down. That's kind of what a bear market is. Once the market gets excessively expensive, uh, there's too much risk taking behavior, it's almost like a reset, right? But let's look, the two important stats here, ready? Let me, let me find it here, okay. Uh, all right, so the average price decline in a bear market has been 35%. Now, what did I say the average bull market was? Over 100? Okay, so the average bear has been about a 35% drawdown, and it's lasted 289 days or nine months on average. All right? So I'm not that good at math, but I do know 100 is more than 35, and I know that two and a half years is better than nine months, and so point is, again, the odds and the probabilities are in your favor as long as you stay invested. Because, again, timing the market, it's got two, two sort of decisions, right? It's not just when to get out of the market, but also when to get back in the market. And I know that's, you know, again, speaking of my own personal portfolio, I always struggle with the getting back in piece, right? It's easy to, you know, see when everything's negative. That's great. But usually the stock market kind of front runs the economy, and so it will see 
the good news. It'll see the sun on the horizon before we can see it. And by the time I you know, put my money back in, it's already been priced in. Um, all right, so I think we've got maybe two more slides and just a couple more minutes. This slide talks about a balanced portfolio and why it's so important. My name for this slide is always having to say I'm sorry, right? just sort of like my marriage. Always telling her I'm sorry. I'm sorry or you were right. Those always seem to happen. Um, <laughs> So there's two different regimes here, right? So this is 2000 to 2002, right? So that is the tech wreck. And you could see stocks were deeply negative and bonds did really well. And so what did you, you, know, what did you say to Paul? Why the heck do I own stocks? Right? Go to the next regime, right? So this is 2000 to 2007. Right? We had a very long bull market, very long expansion. You can see stocks are up, what's that, about 80%, bonds are up 20%. So you're calling your client advisor and say, why do I own bonds? Why, why, why do you have me in these? Right? And so every regime you go through is, why do I own stocks? Why do I own bonds? Because it always feels like that. But over the long term, if you look here down, look at these numbers, the growth of $10,000, you'll see the balanced portfolio right here completely and utterly outplaces both stocks and bonds. Well, stocks does pretty good, but you'd take on a lot more volatility. So I guess the, the point is here is, Number one, staying invested, being diversified, but it's also, again, to get a little nerdy, sorry I'm into this stuff, ge it's the concept of geometric returns, okay? So let's say you're up 100% one year, okay? You've done very well. The next year you're down 50%, so here's 100, you're down 50%, okay? You lost 50% of your money. To get back to even, how much do you need to get back to even? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's not 50%. Everyone's like, well, you lost 50%. No, it's not. You need 100%, right? So that's the concept of geometric returns. It's why you want to always focus on losing less if you want to have longer, stronger capital appreciation. So lose less to win more. Um, all right, let's, let's see where we're at. We're doing okay on time here. Um, ah. We're gonna skip this one in the interest of time because I really like this next chart. And then we're gonna close it out. We're gonna ask for some questions and maybe some book recommendations. I love books, I'm super passionate about books. So I'm gonna drop some book recommendations on you. So buying stocks after big market drops has historically been profitable, okay? So what we're showing here is, this is the growth of $10,000 back in 1990. Excuse me, 1980, 1980. The blue bar here shows a 1.6 million dollars, right? That's if you put $2,000 into your account every time the market drops 8%, okay? The gray bar here is about, looks like about 500,000. If every time the market dropped 10%, excuse me, 8%, you took out 2,000, you just went to cash. And then the middle line is, if you just left it alone, you're at 1.1. So again, it kind of, it's kind of another way to show that other slide where if you miss the 10 best days or you miss the 20 best days, et cetera, it's just another way to look at it. Um, but it's just another reminder that instead of calling the team when you're worried, um, or actually maybe you still do call the team, but instead you give them $1,000 instead of asking them to transfer $1,000 to your, to your cash. Right, to, to your, what's the local bank around here? Uh, TD Bank, Wells Fargo, what do you have around here? Chase, what is it? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Transfer, instead of transferring $1,000 from your brokerage account to that, send it from there to your brokerage account. Um, anyways, long story short, I hopefully uh, I, I've left you with some thoughts on the economy, um, some thoughts on the stock market. Uh, I would say, if, if someone was to ask our view, um, we're probably right where the rest of you are. I mean, I think when, when Paul had a poll question, he said, are you really optimistic? You're really negative? Everyone's like kind of in the middle. I think that's kind of where we're at. I would say uh, we do believe, uh, I would say in terms of probabilities, that there will likely be a slowdown in the next 12 months, particularly in the middle to the end of next year. Is it an outright recession? I think that's still touch and go. Um, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that, and, and there's obviously can be exogenous shocks at any time, like we just had one. Um, but I think 
if I really leave you with something, it's just the concept of diversification, thinking long-term, not panicking. Um, I have a slide here, or excuse me, a presentation, or not even, a handout, actually, and I can share with Paul and the team, and they can share to all of you. But it's called, uh, Military Conflicts May Rattle Markets, But Not For Long. And what I like about this piece, it goes through, you know, every geopolitical or military event for the past uh, 70 years, right? And it shows the markets probabilities, how often was it up, how many months later? So for example, like, you know, Germany invades France. We were down 15% three months later. We were down 22% one year later. And three years later, though, we were positive. Right? And so it goes through each event and it just shows, you know, probabilities are really on our side. When you, when you have one of these military or geopolitical events, on average, 75% of the time, one year later, the stock market was positive. So again, it's just it's another proof point uh, just to be focused on the long term and remain diversified. So that's all the comments I have prepared. Um, happy to talk questions. And then also, like I said, I want to mention a few books that, that, uh, that I'm into that I think would be great for all of you, maybe. Questions, anything? Oh, great. What do you have? I'll come over and then I'll just repeat it. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, Andrew had a great question. It was about AI and in general, how, how we think it's going to um, revolutionize the world, let's say, but no, affect the economy and also affect stocks. Um, so right now, there is a lot of enthusiasm about it, and right now, the enthusiasm from a stock market perspective reminds me of 99 in the year 2000, when there was you know, many companies that sort of, again, didn't have earnings um, and were sort of priced to perfection. So NVIDIA specifically is the poster child for that right now. Um, yes, 100%, we do believe that AI will have an impact. Um, it's already having an impact, right? Sort of the uh, Google, Microsoft, Apple, they all use large language models, harness big data, that's essentially AI. Um, and we do believe that it will sort of change some of the dynamics uh, in the workforce. For example, you know, there'll, there'll be some jobs that go away, but there'll also be some jobs that are created from AI. So there'll be sort of a, a net net in our view. Um, but right now, the enthusiasm associated with it, I think it's our view is that's gonna be challenging to meet some of the earnings expectations that are priced into these stocks. So I think it's one of those things that uh, the theme is real and the theme will come true, uh, but how much optimism is currently priced into those AI stocks it may be a little rich right now. Maybe a little rich for our blood is, is probably the best way to frame it. You want to have exposure to those stocks, but if you were to plow all in on that theme, I think there's a, a, it's very risky and there's a chance that um, it may take longer for the theme to play out than you can stay solvent. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe I, I touched on housing. Oh, go ahead. Yes, what's that? I'm not sure. I think it's appropriate. Okay, all right. Judy, okay. So Judy had a question. She said that BlackRock and Vanguard own everything. So what I, what I think you mean is that um, there are index funds, right? And so you can buy an index fund that essentially tracks the S&P 500, right? Or it tracks international markets, right? If it's an index fund. So you're literally buying the entire index. In the U.S., you'd be buying all 500 companies, or an international would be buying all, you know, 14,000 companies in the universe. And so, a lot of money has gone into those vehicles, these passive index vehicles, over the past 10 years. Um, and the firms that manage those ETFs are BlackRock and Vanguard. So that's where that sort of theory comes from. Um, but do they really own the own everything? No. No, and, and a great example I use is, actually look at the S&P 500 right now, right? If it was true that because of all that money that's going into these index funds, right, that's gonna push the whole stock market up, right? That would mean all 500 stocks are doing well. But look at the dispersion 
in the S&P 500 year to date. I already mentioned the top seven account for 70% of the returns. And there's a number of companies that are down 25, 30, 40%. So that still tells me that there is price discovery in markets, that investors are still bidding up the stocks that they have good expectations about and bidding down stocks they have bad expectations about. If BlackRock and Vanguard owned everything and you could just, if it was so easy, you could just buy a passive index, the entire index would go up in, locks, in lockstep. And that isn't what we're seeing. So no, I don't think they own everything, not yet at least. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, the uh, credit ratings of the U.S. government have on uh, the stock market. That's a great question. So that, that is one that I was just thinking about on the way over here. Um, so credit ratings are kind of related to our debt levels. And right now, the U.S.'s debt is about 100% of GDP. So big number. Definitely scary. I mean, I would say it's, uh, it's a concern, something that I think we definitely talk about and think about um, when I talk to portfolio managers and analysts. Um, but it's not the highest in the world. Like Japan's over 200%. Italy's 150%. Now, I'm not comparing our economy to their economy because they both have interesting, unique dynamics. Um, but it is certainly something that I think both parties need to sort of come across the aisle and resolve. Um, because if not, here are the consequences. One would be higher interest rates, right? So that means other countries now think, you know, we could default on our debt. They're going to stop buying our treasury securities, right? They're going to stop buying our debt, right? And if they don't buy our debt, that's going to raise interest rates. So interest rates are going to be higher. Two, this is a big one, higher taxes, right? Now that rates are higher, the government has to pay more money to service that debt. So that's higher taxes, which I think is, you know, generally going to lead to less innovation, less risk taking. Okay. Um, and then the other one, I would just say slower economic growth in general. All right. So if the government now needs to use more of their budget to pay off the debt, instead of creating programs to stimulate growth, that's bad for the economy. So I guess that's a long winded way of saying if, if they don't eventually come across the aisle, figure out a way to lower debt. Um, those are the three things that can happen, you know, slower economic growth, higher taxes, uh, and higher interest rates, which is all bad for the economy, in my opinion, and, and bad for stocks. So yeah, it's something that needs to be addressed. But it's not, this isn't like the newest problem, and I also don't like to necessarily blame one party. I mean, if you look at debt levels, they've been going up for 50 years. It's just really accelerated since 2008, 2009. It started with the bank bailouts, and it's gotten progressively more expensive since then. Oh, hi again. <laughs>
I don't know, 100 plus years. Um, and, and you know, hopefully will never be replicated, but you know, we, we obviously don't know. I think that's the one thing that is unique. When, where I thought you were going with the question was sort of like, well, is this time different or something along those lines? And what I always respond to is that um, while certain individual events that happen in the economy of the world may be different, what is never different is what really ultimately drives a stock market, and that's investor emotion, fear, greed. Like, those things never go away. And that's why these cycles, these bubbles continue to happen. We all sort of know about it intuitively that, hey, this seems pretty expensive, but, you know, when, you're, when your friend is making all this money on Bitcoin, then you want to get involved. Or your friend was flipping houses, and now you want to get involved. Or now your friend's making a lot of money in NVIDIA and and uh, you know, AI stocks, right? So that, those, those emotions, greed, and then on the opposite, when you know, the market does crash, you know, home builders stop building, or you go to cash, like those slides talked about, uh, fear, those are the things that really ultimately drive markets, and those never change. So um, I think COVID's a unique dynamic that maybe changed the, the sort of magnitude of those graphs and maybe the way we think about uh, the economy and stocks, but I think what ultimately is gonna drive it That'll never change, particularly over long periods of time. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to close. Can I close down with like a couple book recommendations? Okay, thank you, Paul. All right, so I love books, um, and so I'm going to give you a couple. One that I've been reading lately: some finance books and some off the wall books uh, as well. So uh, a finance book that I like a lot that that is is pretty easy to read, very digestible. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Really good book. It has like 19 different short stories in it, um, and it just has different financial lessons. You know, like, but it, but it's not you know super in the weeds. It's not going to go into my duration and bond math, right? It's more just about, hey, you need to take risk to you know generate wealth, but then you need to diversify to maintain your wealth, right? So just thinking about those different concepts. You know, what you did to attain wealth is different to preserve wealth. So that's one that always resonates with me. Um, it's called the psychology of money. That's a good one. Just came out two, three years ago. That's a really good book. Um, another one, I love Westerns. So I, I finally finished Lonesome Dove last year. Um, that book's incredible. So for anyone who, I know you probably saw the TV show, but the book is incredible. Um, what else did I think? Oh, crime fiction. So uh, I like Dennis Lehane. He did like uh, Shutter Island, Mystic River. Great author if you like crime, noir fiction. Uh, biography. My biography, just bought this for a friend of mine, Unbroken, great book. If any, I think they made a movie out of that, but I've only seen, but basically uh, Louis Zamperini was, uh, came up uh, just before World War II, went to the Olympics, was a fighter pilot, got shot down over the Pacific, was stranded at sea for 45 days. He was finally rescued, but he was re rescued by a Japanese. And so he spent time in a POW camp for two and a half, three years. Incredible book, incredible life story. So that's another book I'd recommend. And then the final book, I'm going to close out on another finance book. Um, this one's a little bit more in the weeds um, for folks that really want to get into the finance stuff. Uh, it's called The Most Important Thing by Howard Marks. And Howard Marks has been a fixed income investor for 40 to 50 years, really specialized in high yield and distressed debt. And one of my favorite concepts in the book, he introduces the concept of second level thinking. Right? And so second level thinking is, in short, Stocks are falling, right? The economy's terrible. I need to sell. That's first level thinking. Second level thinking is everyone else is selling. That means the market's on sale right now. I need to buy. So that's the concept of second level thinking. I love that book as well. So thanks for the time. Thank you, Paul Reed and the team for having me. Well, thank you. And you notice a lot of similar concepts that we talk about in our meetings. Let me elaborate on a couple things. AI, um, where's the AI question? So we had a money manager in different money manager, we meet with them regularly, money manager on Monday at our team meeting who talked about AI. And what they said also to elaborate on what Lewis said is AI is in everything right now. And the reason we use actively managed fund versus index funds, really clear here. Index funds, if you invest in the S&P 500, guess where about 70% of your money's going to, or 30%. Those five stocks, guess what's happening? It's artificially pushing up those stock values. Doesn't make an awful lot of sense. But guess what your active managers do? They're looking at where the opportunities are. They're looking at even AI, how it's incorporated in 
traditional legacy companies. And so they're looking at buying these companies, maybe at attractive values based on their analysis, because they're expected perhaps not to be the overvalued companies, but be the next companies that grow. So where IA is really, AI is really important is looking at how it is in, 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 uh, uh, integrated in processes that already exist with other companies. Second thing to elaborate on, we talked about, talked about value versus growth. All of you have seen the chart, 20 years of the best and the worst. Remember all the colored box charts? Remember that called the Callan chart, look at that periodic table? That's exactly what we're talking about. The reason why we're diversified is because, frankly, economies go in, in, in cycles, and asset classes go in cycles. So it doesn't look really good right now, it looked really good last year. Think about the tech companies last year, think about what's happening this year. Think about what's happening right now. Talk about, talk about CDs, look really good right now. Guess what's gonna happen in two or three years? Probably not so good. Guess what's gonna happen to stocks probably in two or three years? Probably look a lot better. So just remember there's some common themes here that are emphasized there too. The other thing they elaborate on is uh, your, your bonds. We call it foundation, the foundation part of your portfolio. Again, just like Lewis mentioned, you have a shorter term portion for the most of, most of your portfolio, some international. But think about that. What's really happening, just like CDs are earning really nicely, guess what's happening to these bonds? These are bonds backed by companies like Procter & Gamble, Colgate Palmolive, government bonds. They're two to three year in terms of maturity or duration. And guess what? We talked to a money manager, another one, several, several about a couple, uh, two months ago, who said bonds right now are strangely not recognized as one of the most attractive asset categories right now. And we said, wait a minute, why is that? He says, what I could do, this is in your portfolio, most of your portfolios have this manager in them. In the portfolio, what he says I can do is buy a two to three year bond backed by a major corporation at anywhere from five to 10% below par. Now remember, two to three year bonds, it's gonna mature right at par. He says they're yielding five to 6%. So he says bonds right now are one of the most no brainer investments. I can get a yield to maturity, or some have called it what's called a yield to worst because some have call dates, of anywhere from five, six, even 7%. So my point is, now, now what happens in your portfolio? Does it look like your foundation portion's going up like that? Of course it doesn't. Think about, I love the analogy, Green Lake, you're walking the dog, the Jack Russell, you're seeing the Jack Russell stuff on your statements right now, you're seeing the Jack Russell stuff when you look at your portals. What we're looking at is the economy, we're looking at the long term. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, we've got a drawing and some of you are gonna be winners and hopefully, so that puts it into perspective. Um, then what I've got is really three takeaways to keep in mind and a four point action plan. This is some of my old, I used to work for Boeing for five years, some of my old <laughs> Boeing stuff coming out. You gotta have takeaways, you gotta have an action plan. Based on what you've heard today and based on the, the process that we've gone through with all of you in the planning. As we wrap up our session today, um, let me give you three takeaways and a four-point action plan. And this is really after we thought about it, after you know, you've heard the information, and as we think about it, as we as your advisors, what would we have you do? I think that every good meeting, seminar, conference, whatever it might be, you gotta have an action item or an assignment or something. So let me give you these. And uh, some of these are gonna resonate with you from the meetings you've had, from what the speaker said. First of all, number one, there may be more challenging times ahead, especially in the short term, and maybe a recession. The good news is declines are normal, you heard some of that, and better times follow. A couple of statistics. There have been 11 recessions since 1950. One year later, in 10 of the 11 recessions, the markets have been positive, and the average return has been plus 29%. So when you hear the word recession, the markets are usually coming out of it because see what happens is markets tend to respond before a recession ends. They tend to go down before a recession is declared and go up before a recession ends. Next takeaway. Oh, the other thing, by the way, about challenging times, and this research we did too, and thank you, Adam, for this. Uh, market events, I'm gonna call these military market events. How did the markets do during wartime? Remember, the past is not a guarantee of the future, but it's a guideline to help us deal with what we have going on right now. And so, since Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, there have been 21, I'm gonna call them, my term, military market events. This includes 
the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the Six-Day War in 1967, Yom Kippur War in 1973, Iraq invasion of Kuwait in 1990, U.S. terrorist attack 9-11, bombing of Syria 2017, and many others. There's 21. So um, now of those 21, the average decline after the event was 21 days. Now some have been, oh, some have been double that, some have been less than that. The average return six months after the market event occurred, the military market event. Because remember, remember the, the dog in the economy. When we have a war, I'm not, obviously we all, uh, I mean, it's de devastating what's happening. I don't even go into that. Not necessary, not appropriate. But we do know the economy still has to move. The economy still has to, has to work. And what happens, these money managers are looking for opportunities. So first of all, six months after those events occurred, um, the markets were up 4.2% on the average. 12 months after the market, military market event occurred, markets were up 7.2%. So first takeaway. Second takeaway, don't let the media, your emotions or short-term thinking or well-meaning friends cause you to deviate from your well-designed long-term plan. You see, your, your strategy that you have today is a product of three decades of our history over time. And we as an advisory team, although you may not have, have been through 9-11, been through Y2K, been through COVID, been through the Great Recession, so your portfolio really is a product of our research and our knowledge uh, throughout all those periods of time. We don't necessarily protect you from the declines, but we try and soften those blows so when the markets come up, we're still participating to drive that long-term result, which means you can have retirement security. Now, number three, learn, this is my takeaway now, learn from five noted experts about what they have to say about market declines and recessions. I'm gonna give you some quotes, and, so, and you're gonna know the names. And these quotes, I think, are valid now, they be valid in a year, they were valid 10 years ago. First of all, Mark Twain. Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat itself, but oftentimes rhymes. Think about that. And Warren Buffett. Now listen to this. No one's going to argue Warren Buffett's a poor investor. He's an excellent investor. Warren Buffett says the stock market is a device to transfer money from the impatient to the patient. <laughs> and then he also says this. A market downturn doesn't bother us. It's an opportunity to increase our ownership of great companies with great management at good prices. Rob Arnott. Rob Arnott, for many of you, most of you have what's called the PIMCO All Asset Fund. Managed by Rob Arnott, by the way, noted money manager. What he says, in investing, what is comfortable is rarely profitable. Wisdom there. John Templeton. The four most dangerous words in investing are, you can repeat it if you want, this time is. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further than that. This time is different. It always is. But there's similarities. Think about Mark Twain's quote, a rhyme. Because I would say that everybody might say 9-11 was different. COVID was different. The Great Recession was different. But oh my goodness, we've got a Middle East war in Ukraine. It's different, but it rhymes. So think about that. But the, the axiom is that's the most dangerous. If you, if you say this time is different and then want to respond to that, that's the problem. That's the issue. And John Kenneth Galbraith, pillar in the economic circles, the function of economic, now this is something interesting here. The function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. I don't have to say any more about that. So <laughs> what do you need to know right now? What are the takeaways? First of all, stay calm. Takeaways. There's four takeaways. I think it is stay calm, keep a long-term perspective, and limit your exposure to the media. OK? Next takeaway, maintain a balanced and diversified portfolio consistent with your objectives, obviously. And uh, third takeaway. Remember that we as your financial team are proactive on your behalf within foundation and within growth, expecting market declines uh, and, and navigating through those, and money managers 
are dynamic in what they do, and we're managing those effectively. And finally, the last takeaway, and we'll be dismissed, is contact us if your objectives change, if your risk temperament is tested, because we're your consultants. That's what we're here for. That's what we're honored to be serve to serve as, and uh, and uh, and that's what you pay us for. So we thank you very much. And uh, hey, great session. I appreciate you all being here. Take care.